开始，我现在很荣幸的介绍我们的讲者，呃，汉俊伟呃老师。那他是我们呃台大外文系呃的呃德文老师。可是呢，他有一个非常厉害的这个呃嗯、呃，应该说他的杰作哈、哦。那我在这边很荣幸的这个呃来呃展示给大家看，这是他在二零一二年。二零一二年出的有关 Finnegan's Wake 的书，叫做《The Double Life of E. C. E. Wake》啊，那呃，就是很很棒的一本书。那其实他除了这个英文著作，这是用英文写的，可是除了这个英文著作，其实他还有呃德文的专书，也是一样研究这个呃 Finnegan's Wake。那呃，汉俊伟老师他是德国汉诺威大学的文学博士。那他的这个研究的呃范围，当然现我们知道他是啊、呃、乔伊斯专家以外呢，其实他也研究过美国文学。所以呢，呃，他呃，那现在他的研究领域还包含那个当代的一些理论，还有文化研究啊这些。所以我相信呃，我们可以从他的这个演讲当中。呃，会获得非常多的这个呃深度的一个关于作品、关于现代文学对于现代文化有很深入的了解。所以，我们今天非常的荣幸，请呃汉俊伟老师来呃进行我们这个学期爱尔兰学会呃所做的第一次的演讲啊、呃。那我们现在欢迎汉老师。好，那先谢谢啊，陈、呃、系主任。啊，是讲的毛，谢谢。<笑>然后就啊、嗯，我就开始 feeling and sway。然后就是先走开一下。OK， 嗯 ，Yeah， feeling and sway。Everyone has heard about it. No one's read it.、Mm -hmm. So please, just an initial question: Has everyone ever tried to read feeling and sway? Yes. Okay. Try and has tried. Well, I mean, I'm I'm still trying. <laughs> so,、uh, I'm not saying that I'm an expert in this sort, but.、Uh, So has anyone ever read it like from cover to cover? Basically, it's like this: you start first paragraph, say, "Well, that's interesting," and then put it away. I'm going to read it tomorrow, <laughs> and then it's one year, two years, ten years, and then you find it again. Say, "Well, I'm going to start again," right? And then you find out, well, it's interesting. The first paragraph is very different right now, right? That's one of these very, very bad things about Finnegan's Wake.、So, like, whenever you read it, it becomes different, right? So and、um, it kind of changes with you. And with your understanding of literature, you know, of course, of life, because I mean, you make new experiences and everything. You get older. It's not good, but it happens, right? But still, so Finnegan's Wake.、Like, I mean, I just saw this end of the introduction to James Joyce, the documentary, and of course, they already talked a little about Finnegan's Wake.、Like. So you know, it was written over a period of 17 years, 1922 to 1939. Well, I mean, this is a long time. Of course, he did not write every day. I mean, it was kind of like、uh, affected by his,、uh, you know, bad eyesight. He had to have some operations on his eyes, which almost rendered him blind. Plus, there's family problems, and Joyce always had money problems. You know, he was kind of these heavy drinkers, right? But very creative, very inspired heavy drinkers. So, alcoholism in this kind of、uh, context basically did something to humanity because. Without it, we wouldn't have Ulysses and Phineas Wake. So I mean, he sacrifices help for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Now I'm just going to have to like this. So Joyce, he said, Phineas Wake will keep research busy for the next 300 years.、Um, probably yes.、Um, so you can say, wow, interesting. This sounds like a great practical joke prank on literary research. Well, I mean, we can say like at this publication. But now it's always been seven, seventy-six years. So we've been busy researching it. Problem was in the beginning, no one really paid attention to it. It came out at the worst time, 1939, Second World War started, and of course people were busy doing other things、uh, and not reading Finnegan's Wake. All right. So anyway, so he kind of saw the potential of it to confuse people. As you have already heard in the documentary. It's called the Book of the Dark, the Book of the Night.、Um, in contrast to Ulysses, which is usually called the Book of the Day, although a big section plays at night, of course. So, 
in the feeling of way, there's always like references to this darkness. Like, uh, it's no vanilla but by swamp light. Um, if you see no vanilla but, well, of course, it's Dublin spelled backwards, and it's a new Dublin, right? So it's a new kind of Dublin. It's the dark Dublin. It's like the opposite Dublin of the Dublin of Ulysses uh, of the day. So basically, it's a counter version of all this what he's written before, and of course, every single part of the previous works reappears in Finnegan's Wake, distorted as parody, and uh, you know, in a collage and everything. So basically, sometimes it's very, very hard to kind of get to, to, to kind of like uh, solve this riddle and to see through it, right? As you can see here in Novo Nilva, he's obsessed with language games, plays with words, and everything. So if you have a book of 628 pages, of course, this is a real challenge, right? It's like a huge riddle. And that's why many people thought it was such a mysterious book. So, first to the title, Finnegan, of course, apart from being an Irish surname, in it we find coded Finn again. And Finnegan, which already kind of hints to like uh, this cycle of being and dying, rebirth, death, and everything. Anyway, Finnegan's Wake. First of all, it's a reference to a very, very famous popular ballad of that time. And I'm going to play, play this in a minute for you. So, the ballad of Finnegan, of Tim Finnegan, it used to be a very popular ballad in music halls. I don't know if you're familiar with the music hall tradition. It's about like mid 1900s until almost like mid 20th century. Popular entertainment, ballads, um, playful dramas, and everything. And Finnegan's Wake gained popularity in these music hall traditions, right? So people went there for entertainment. And I'm going to play this ballad for you, and I want you to listen, and first of all, just listen to the overall character of this ballad. You know, there's many theses about Finnegan's Wake. It's a mysterious book. It's a dark book. It's written in the language of the Druids. Because, of course, Joyce did not know that language. But to conceal something for the reader. Why? I mean, why would you publish a 600-page book if you want to conceal something, if you want to hide something, okay? So there's very, very many different uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories about the text. Now, please listen to the ballad, and then, you know, just tell me what you think. Thank you. 
Okay, um, what do you think? So, does it sound mysterious or <laughs> tragic? I mean, he dies, of course, it's tragic, yes. But he rises again. I actually wanted to have the lyrics next to the song, which didn't happen, of course. I'm sorry about that, but um, just to get the basic idea. Um, basically, it's a folk culture. And um, I mean, there's many versions of this ballad. There was no copyright at that time. So basically, I mean, there's many, many different texts. So I kind of like, I got a mixed version of all these texts uh, on the internet, uh, the CDs, everything. Well, I mean, Tim Finnegan lived in Walking Street, a gentleman Irish might be uh, He had a brogue so rich and sweet, and to rise in the world he carried a heart. Now, he had a bit of a tippler's way, so he was a drunk, basically. Uh, for the love of the liquor, he was born. Um, that was basically his uh, sending somehow. So to send him on his way each day, he had dropped the paper every morning. So every morning, he first had some whiskey to get him on his way to be able to work, right? So, okay. So now what happens is, he's too drunk one day. Uh, this is the chorus. Um, quite a happy chorus, right? Everyone's dancing. You know where they're dancing? It is wake. He's dead. It's a funeral, basically. I mean, the wake is traditionally they put the corpse somewhere and they eat things, right? And um, so basically, it's at uh, the deceased one's home. Um, it's not a kind of European tradition. I guess it's more like an Irish and or American tradition still. And um, so, while the corpse is there, they celebrate, they eat, they dance, they drink. So it's a celebration of life in the presence of the dead. So that's what it is. Now, what happens now is because he's too drunk, he falls off the ladder, breaks his skull, and so they rush his corpse home, and the wake starts immediately. Wow, this sounds a little bit not very credible, but it's a song. So they put him up on the bed, a bottle of whiskey at his feet, and a barrel of porter at his head. That's uh, very, very interesting. <laughs> and uh, remember, because he had the love for liquor. And uh, all the friends come and they, well, pay their respects and say goodbye. And the widow Finnegan brings up pipes, tobacco, brandy punch. And now it happens, some of the Finnegan guests, they start arguing about the lovely corpse of Tim Finnegan. Of course, he had many girlfriends out there because he was just a lovely man. Yeah? And what happens is they have a fight. And uh, so it's Mary Murphy and Billy O'Brien. They start arguing that fight. And then civil war soon engage. A row and eruption soon begun. Wow. So it's total chaos. What happens is during this chaos, a bottle of whiskey flies over Tim Maloney's head and falls on the corpse. And you know, whiskey kind of like uh, spills all over the corpse. And then Tim Finnegan, he resurrects, he revives. <laughs> And he rises again, and says, well, don't worry, we're still around like blazes, you know? So, do you think I'm dead? So he wasn't dead, you know? But anyway, it's like death and resurrection, but it's not tragic at all. It's funny, right? So this is kind of like this uh, grotesque Renaissance humor, right? So, and if you see this kind of like the themes of death and resurrection in this text, considering the bell we just heard, I mean, of course, I mean, there are reference to the Egyptian Book of the Dead and everything. And, um, you know, very, very deep and uh, spiritual books, of course, and the Bible is one of them, you know? But it's like in this kind of like folk culture context, which makes it actually much more enjoyable. And, um, of course, also as a parody, uh, Joyce had a favor. Well, he, is, he loved parodies and everything, like playing with words. I mean, if you look at Ulysses, 
especially a Cyclops, the Cyclops chapter. Everything we find there basically reappears in uh, Finnegan's story. You know? And um, so, um, looking at it like as a mystery book, I don't know. You know? Part of it, yes. But the overall character is actually, it's a very funny book. And it's very enjoyable to read if you kind of like um, read yourself into it. Well, it takes time. And of course, as I said, it gets different every time. Most importantly, um, don't pay attention to these weird words and how they're spelled. The first time I tried to read it at 17, I was on the train. I thought, well, I've got two hours. I'm going to read it this way. And it was a stupid idea. You know? <laughs> By 17 years old, I mean, what do you know at 17? You know? So as I said, well, I read the first paragraph, and that was it. right? And then, of course, saying, well, it's not really so bad. I can't. I don't know any of these words. You know? So the dictionary, none of these words appears. So, well, why is that? So my God, so my English is bad. Right? Um, as I found out, many people's English is that bad, you know, because, um, of course, this is not real words. It's like portmanteau, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's holy linguistic construction, right, for many languages. So, the bell that I just played for you kind of reappears in the text, especially in the beginning. So, if you see it, that his heart had heavy, his heart it did shake. Now, this is like an intertextual reference, you know, hypertextual. And then something different. There was a wall, of course, in direction, dim. He started from the ladder, damn. He was dud dumb. Master Ben, Master Ben. When a man marries, he sleeps all along for the whole the world to see. Yeah? Uh, you see the sexual references. They're all over the book. Uh, sometimes you can get a little wary of that because you get the point. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> now, it's still fun. Okay. But um, so there are so many uh, references. And uh, outside of the bell, of course, I mean, it's like uh, one of the basic texts there. Um, but so he kind of like he deviates from that and extends the text of meaning by mixing a uh, term from other languages in there. But it still sounds like the ballad, right? This is the most important thing. Like uh, it's all about the ear. I mean, like if you hear it, if you hear James Joyce read it, those recordings on YouTube and everything, much of these very very intricate passages become much clearer, right? So don't look at the text first. Yeah? First listen to it. And I said, oh, wait a minute. And there's like, some extra meaning in there. right? It kind of like links it to other texts and there's some other traditions. So you can get a lot from there. Now, it goes on, just for your entertainment. Right? Uh, Scheiß, um, well, it's a reference to German shit. Of course, <laughs> huh? I should she be cool, be cool, or why did you die? Now, oh, why did you die to the right? I was trying Thursday morning, Thursday, right? So he was thirsty Thursday. in the morning, yeah? but it's also Thursday. Yeah? So subs decided at Philigan's Chrysoris week. Philigan, Philigan, yeah? One more beer, please. Yeah? And now it's Philigan's week. Yeah? And Finnegan, well, all the hooligans of the nations, yeah? the hooligans and hooligans, prostrated in their consternation and their duodicinally profuse plethora of ululation. There was plums and grooms and trevors and citterers and raiders and salmon too. And they all gained, in which the shout was joviality, a god and a god, and the round of them, a grog. So a grog, you know, it's also a drink, right? They laid him brought down uh, along last bed with a buculips of finicky for his feet and a barrel load of Guinnesses for his head. So, as you saw, there's a bucket of whiskey at his feet and a barrel of water at his head. Now it becomes a barrel load, but of Guinnesses. It could be Guinness, but it could also be, be Genesis. And then you have like death and resurrection again, because here it's the apocalypse, the apocalypse, right? And not the bottle of. So it's all these plays of words, but actually, I mean, subconsciously you know what's going on, right? You don't have to really analyze everything that uh, detail. So another thing, this cycle of death and resurrection, I, it's like everyone knows that the text of the wake is a cyclical structure. It's like a giant circle. It becomes very, very obvious when you get to the end of the book. And then look at the beginning again. That's the famous first sentence. River run past even atoms from shore to shore to Bevan Bay, bringing us by a commodious because of the circulation back to Hope Castle and environs. Now, this is the beginning. I'm just going to talk about this later on. And this is the end. End here, ascend, thin again, take the softly, metamorphy, till thousands the whatever, <laughs> the keys to, given, 
Away, alone, alas, beloved, along the. Why does the text end with a the, right? If you take the whole thing and you kind of like print it out and make it a circle and then you connect the ends, basically this leads to the beginning again. Like this. So we just have this away, alone, alas, beloved, along the river run as even that. So you can read it again when you're done. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wouldn't advise you to do so. But uh, well, I think it's like a lot of work to go through this anyway. It's good that there's a lot of like, comments on this book, and uh, you need uh, the commentary because otherwise you won't get far, right? So, yeah. So the structure itself is quite easy. Four parts, part one, so eight chapters, part two, four chapters, part three, also four chapters, and part four, also one final chapter, and Olivia's a little queen. When she fades out into the ocean, and then starts where she came from, right? Okay. All right. Now that brings us to the main characters. Actually, some already appeared, coded in the text. I have to pay attention to some things like HC, that's like um, the initials of the male protagonist, if you will, Humphrey Chimney Deerwicker. Here comes everybody, of course, right? He's, you know, just the normal, usual guy in this modernity, right? No one's special. Could be everyone. And he's also a whole castle of iron, it's a giant rock, a mountain, right? We just saw this whole castle and environs in the beginning part, right? The river run goes back, you know, makes a circle and gets to the whole castle and environs. So that's how, without knowing, you already saw the main protagonist appear in the text. Now he's got very, very different roles. Uh, first of all, he's a mountain. And then he's a savage Viking and conqueror of Ireland, and uh, he subdues Anne Olivia, his wife, and the whole nation, basically, right? So, um, but he's also much more, he's festy king, he is a potential rapist, he is a pervert, and a whatever. So basically every role you can think of, right? So that's the big problem, because every one of these main characters reappears in different masks. So it's hard to kind of like say what their actual, uh, you know, what, what their part is in the book, then, right? So basically it's kind of like, there are some guidelines, okay? Um, like the tra traditional patriarchal family model, if you will. But it changes all the time. So you kind of have to see through these, um, you know, the way they talk and everything, and you say, oh, well, no, this is like, uh, that's Shen again, the writer. And no, that's Sean the Post, right? So it's difficult. His wife, mm -hmm. the most famous figure of the book, ALP, and Olivia Plurivo, um, actually is probably the most accessible of these characters. Because uh, the most famous chapter of the book, and Olivia Plurivo, is not that hard to understand. Um, it was one of the first that was published. It was the first that was published, I guess, yeah. And um, so it was kind of like Joyce, when he was writing the book, always published segments of it. But they were already, always changed again, right? To make it fit like uh, a context. So it's like, um, we call it work in progress. and. Um, because, I mean, how do you finish such a book? At some point, you have to say, okay, now, no more. That's it, 17 years, that's it, right? And um, there's some, Shem the Penman, um, of course, James Joyce himself, mm -hmm. yeah, a writer, and an alcoholic. Sean the Post, his brother. You know, John, uh, Joyce's brother, Stanislaus Joyce, um, he was very important for James Joyce to survive. Uh, when he was in Trieste, you know, he had he had a job as English teacher, basically at a language school. You know, uh, many of us foreigners know that the situation was <laughs> <laughs> one, so you can't live of such a job. But his brother supported him, and he took care of like of Nora and uh, of the kids and everything. He was kind of like the stable element uh, in Joyce's life, and uh, of course Nora, so as his wife, also was. But Joyce wasn't really a very responsible person, as it seems, you can tell from Richard Ellen's biography. And Sean, he also used to beat him up when he came home drunk, right? Ken was like, a, well, not a very tall guy, but a very stout guy, and a strong guy, and Joyce was this tall, skinny guy. It's easy to beat him up, of course, you know, for Sean. So he had to kind of like uh, get some discipline to his poet brother. Uh, Stanislaw, of course, oh, 
he hated fitting this weight. He said, what are you doing there? You're just proving how smart you are, right? Smarter than everyone else. But um, he loved uh, uh, Portrait of the Artist, yeah? and parts of Ulysses until you know, the style exercises started. So these two guys, Shen and Sean, they're twins, and they have a symbiotic interplay between both characters, so they need each other. And uh, they always appear like, as a team, but also as rivals. That's very important. You can see the rivalry in uh, segments like the mooks and the gripes. Uh, you know, like the fox and the grapes, right? The Greek fable. The arm and the grace hopper, uh, the ant and the grace hopper, and the grasshopper, right? Um, it's always like the arm, that's Sean and the grace hopper, hoping for some grace, you know, give me money. Now this is James Joyce and Shen. And um, yeah, it's, it's actually very fun. And then there's Izzy, it's the daughter, Isabella. Yeah. Um, she seems to be modeled after James Joyce's daughter, Lucia. Uh, in the documentary I just saw, um, you know, they explained there's schizophrenia and uh, all this. So it was a very, very difficult uh, situation. And uh, James Joyce had a very hard time accepting her illness. Right? And she appears in Finian's way in many, many different, you know, we can say, very schizophrenic uh, roles, right? Because, well, once, one time she's like a princess, and then she's a tramp, and uh, everything. So it's like this ambivalent kind of situation. Um, and if you want to like understand, I mean, that's what I would suggest. If you want to look at Finnegan's way, um, don't start at the beginning. Because you don't know who's who. I would suggest to start with the mind of Nick, Nick and the Maggies, uh, which is part two, chapter one because all the roles are presented first, or introduced, who is who, right? Uh, it's like if you want to read Ulysses, probably you don't want to start with the first chapter, you start with Calypso, right? And then, oh, Leopold Blue, because I was like, who's talking about Leopold Blue? Who's this guy? He doesn't appear, yeah? It's all about the Steven, you know? But now, it's a, it's a good idea, right? So, good luck. Mr. Seamus McQuillot, that's of course Shem, yeah? Here the riddles between the robot and his dress so apparent the gangster in the robot's gallery, the bold bad big boy of the storybooks who then the tabs go up, as we discover because he knew too much, has been discovered to disgrace court by fallen to disgrace. Of course, who discovers this disgrace? His brother, who else? I meant the Floras, his brother, or with it. The Floras, that's Izzy. There might be some relationship between Shem and Izzy, or Sean and Izzy, of some kind of uh, weird kind. Yeah, we don't really know. The floors are the girls who accompany Izzy. The Girl Scouts from St. Bride's finishing establishment demands Essie Dilates, a month's bunch of pretty maidens who, why they pick on her, their pet peeve, from with Valkyrian license to guard for, and now, of course, is it. Miss Beauty Spot, as the attendant is, for a leaflet, a bewitching blonde who dimples delightfully and is approached in loveliness only by her grateful sister affection the mirror, the cloud of the opal, who, having jilted Glock, is being fatally fascinated by, and who is this girl fascinated by? Of course, Chuff. Mr. Sean O'Malley. Uh, Sean is a mailman, uh, so O'Malley, you know, of course. <laughs> See the chalk and sanguine pictograph on the safety drop, the fine frank fair haired fellow on the fairy tales who wrestles for Toho with the bold bad bleak boy blood, generally about cats or pugs or top bags or bog gats or shooting root skin, generally or something until they and embrace a pattern of somebody else or other after they both carried off the scent and brought home to be well soaked, sponge and scrubbed again by, and who would wash their sons, of course. It is the mother and Miss Cory Corriendo, Gresham Sua. Bring the babes, Peter, Potter, and Turi. She misdributes Madamus Moni's after Pernamental Android 11 entries. Pulcinelli's must not miss her nest in Rooster's Rag. Their poor little old mother in you, who is woman of the house, playing opposite to her husband. Hump. A giant hump. You know? Mr. Maydor Go. Read the sayings from Lex de la Saga in the program about King Ericus of Schweden and the spirit's whispers in his magical helmet, cap pipe with watch and topper, coat, crest, and supporters. 
the cause of all of grievance, the world, the flesh, and the trouble, who had impartially recovered from a recent impeachment due to egg everlasting, uh, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall of the egg burst, but though and thoroughly pro-converted, propounded for psychological, is stunning sale once more, gypsies and royalists, and the semblance of the substance for the membranes of the umbrance with the remnants of the ambulance, remaining a quantum supercargo of the rock creek coop in heaven, engaged in entertaining in his pilgrim's custom house at Kahala home upon escrow those statutory persons. <laughs> yeah, and you know, this goes on basically for 600 pages, right? So, yeah, <laughs> you probably have to consume you know, small portions, you know, like every time you look at it. It's very important to think of these characters as pairs. Of course, we have H.C. and A.L.P., the parents. Oh, they're like, a, you know, like a diet. And then Shem and Sean. The problem is there's one character who doesn't have a pair, a partner, and that's Izzy. So that's like how Joyce kind of uh, hints at the partner thing. It's 113 AD, two sons and an hour were born until a good man and his hag. These sons called themselves Caddy and Primus. Primus was a sanctuary man and drilled all decent people. Caddy went to Wine House and rode to peace. A farce, bloody words for Dublin. So we can see, uh huh. So Caddy, of course, is Shem. Of course, it's Joyce. Now, they form this 1132, so 1 is 566, right? Now, Izzy, she's missing a partner for completion. So she's incomplete, she's missing a half. Um, if you read Plato, the symposium, of course, you know, the tragedy of, of being human is being torn apart. You're always missing a missing half, right? of course. Now, this is 566, I think. At this time, it fell out that a brazen love danced a brief, soberness, soberness, because that puppet, her minion, was ravished out there by the ogre, pure, pious, pious, bloody wars, and bloody war, clear belly, whatever this is. So basically, she has to invent her missing puppet, her pet, her mag. And um, she always takes these roles, takes on these roles, and reappears as something very different from her brazen, not dance nature. So sometimes as a prostitute, sometimes as a yeah, tramp, uh, seducing her brother. Uh, so basically not very politically correct, uh, especially at that time when George wrote. HC and ALP, very, very important. Uh, big uh, antagonists. Now, we just saw River Run. River Run, it's important to say, because ALP kind of like is a, a river woman. So now the river flows around the rock of Hofe Castle and Environs. It's a famous site in Dublin, right? So and now we have the Hofe Castle Environs, the uh, HC. And even Adam, of course, their parents of mankind. This is ALP in Zurich. It's a sculpture, and of course, you see the water flowing out there. Yeah, very interesting. Um, if you go there, check it out. And it's also ALP. Yeah, alpha and lambda, e, that's it, ALP. Now, line Greek letters, it's a parody of the scientific style, of course. And then um, you might think about central references. You see that triangle, right? So it's interesting. Basically, it's in a chapter where the kids talk about sexuality and where the kids come from, right? And then it appears. It's kind of diagram. So yeah, that's choice again. He likes to get like this. Now, this is the famous section of the book. And this is like when Anna Olivia has her first solo appearance. Now, that's said, oh, tell me all about how live, you know? And you can take this O oh, either as a mouth, you know, or the elusive triangle if you want. And um, that's how she appears. But she doesn't, she appears as a river, but here it's basically to wash her women who gossip about her evil nature. And um, basically, she is constructed and appears and created through this gossip of the washerwoman standing on the riverbank and, you know, just telling all the bad things about her they heard. Uh, it's also a parody of the epic style, of course, the epic own, eh? own news, hail news, right? And then it starts, and it's like the low voice of Dublin talking. Eh? It's not Homer, no. It's like, uh, you know, low working class, right? 
Oh, tell me all about Anne Olivia. I want to hear all about Anne Olivia. Well, you know Anne Olivia? Yes, of course. We all know Anne Olivia. Tell me all, tell me now, you'll die when you hear. Well, you know, when the old chip went fat and did what you know, yes, I know, go on. Wash the pudding, don't be dabbling. Tuck up your sleeve and loosen your top case. And don't butt me, hype when you live. Or whatever it was they free to make out he tried to do in the foolish part. So they're kind of gossiping about, first of all, how evil this earwig is. And then they turn to Anne Olivia, of course, but first it's her husband. Because he did something bad in the Phoenix Park. What kind of park is that? It's Dublin's Phoenix Park. Phoenix, if you see this as a reference to resurrection again, right? The uh, legendary Phoenix. Now, again, so there we have like, one of the basic motifs of the novel. And he did something to two. To two who? Yeah, to two girls, maybe? So this is like the central mystery of the novel. What happened in this park? And there's many versions of it. We actually don't really know like what definitely happened. Right? He also goes to trial for that, and uh, is then becomes like a carnivalesque uh, king, and is uh, you know debased and everything. So now it's a Phoenix Park incident. HCE had two girls in a scene act, maybe witnessed by three soldiers and publicized. So it goes to the news. Right? Um, you know, at that time the press was a very very uh, powerful uh, public organ. You might remember Oscar Wilde's yeah, try and everything was uh, basically only possible and became such a scandal because of the press. Torrance. So they go on, he's an awful one, right? Look at the shirt of him, so look at his clothes, oh, it's so dirty, I mean this guy's a dirty pig, right? Look at the dirt of it, he has all my water black on me. Wow, so water turns black because of his filth. And it's steeping and steeping since this time last week. How many girls and I wonder, I washed it, I know by heart the places he likes to say, the dirty devil, scorching my hands, starring my family to make his private linen public. So they kind of like gossip and make all his private little things make it public. Yeah? Washing dirty linen in public. Yeah? That's what it is. Now, the language of the way, that's also something that's very, very, well, as you can see, very, very difficult. I mean, is it English or not? Is it a Druid's language? You know? Is it a mystery language of conspiracy so that we do not know what's going on? Well, basically, uh, grammatically speaking, it's just plain English, right? But, but, of course, with many, many plays of words in it. It's very hypertextual. It's parodic. It's, well, you can say there's a very, very strong tie to Renaissance literature. If you read Rabelais, of course, and, uh, not only in French, but if you kind of like look at Renaissance writers from let's say Shakespeare time, uh, in England, Thomas Nash, for instance, uh, Red Harry, um, you can see similar plays of words in there. He did not invent this, right? He just, Joyce was doing something that nobody else did at that time. Right? So, I mean, he's an avant-gardist, of course. If you look at Ulysses, that's like uh, as modern a sense as yet. And Finn is like, but kind of like uh, just reinventing kind of this Renaissance tradition. Now, putting it into a modern context, of course. Now, this is something. Um, and it was not right well received. Many of his friends turned against him and said, oh, what are you doing? I mean, like, uh, and there were, of course, even like letters to Joyce written in the Wake style, you know, making fun of the Wake. How can you make fun of a parody at all? But uh, I don't know. So it kind of like, um, later on, it was better received. People did not see the humor in it. Uh, especially in the translations. Um, if you look at, let's say, well, I mean, German is a lot like English. The German translations, of course, don't just say, wow, what's going to say? Oh, it's going to be something very deep and so on. And uh, wow, this is, I just don't see it. I mean, so, so it doesn't have any value. It's not art, right? How can not be art? I mean, like, turning a very, very normal person's life into like an epic play of words. I mean, if that is not art, nothing is. But So people miss the humor. And of course, in German, people are not very humorous. Anyway, <laughs> it's like, what was, what, what does the poet want to say to us? What is his message? You know, what does it mean for our lives? Yeah, um, yeah I'll probably just it's a grotesque masterpiece, of course. Yeah? Uh, in great parts. Yeah? Of course, not only. So, Navale, of course, not only uh, very, very important for European literature. Uh, if you want to understand modernity, uh, especially in Germany, if you like German literature, 
you have to read Don Juan. You know? I mean, if Spunta Gas, uh, you know, the Tin Drum and everything, and that is just like a picaresque novel. So, I mean, basically, it kind of like renewed literature after the Second World War in Germany. You know? And it was very important for English literature, too. Other, uh, other works of Joyce, of course, is new and that are essential. Howard Stern, The Life and Opinions of Christian Shandy Gentleman. I mean, it's just a playful masterpiece. Uh, I don't know if it's taught at uh, DFLL. It's hard, you yeah? know? Very hard. It's also a big volume. But um, yeah, it's always like, uh, oh, it's, it's got to be postmodern, even before modernity. Why? Because it doesn't fit in the epoch. It's just, it doesn't fit in the tradition of that time. Well, some books are just, uh, you know, probably very, very uh, bold and try new things, right? And uh, so why categorize them? Cyclops of Ulysses. Of course, Joyce used all these uh, grotesque literatures, techniques, and, uh, you know, the uh, picaresque novel, and uh, it's an novel and everything. And if you look closely, many of these uh, plays of words that appear in Finnegan's way, he already tried out in Cyclops. And of course, other parts of Ulysses too. But um, Cyclops is just so obvious because it's just uh, you know making fun of you know, one eye national, national uh, Irish nationalists and everything, right? The Cyclops. So many things can be traced back to that. It's the most famous one, uh, the most obvious one. So they believe in Rod, the Scourger Almighty, creator of hell upon earth, and in Jackie Tar, son of a gun, who has conceived of unholy boast. Born of the fighting navy, suffered under rump and dozen, was sacrificed to flame and curry, yelled like bloody hell. The third day he arose again from the bed, steered into haven, sitteth on his beam end, to further orders whence he shall come, to drudge for a living and be paid. Now, uh, if you come from a, let's say, Christian background in England, English speaking countries, you will know this immediately. It's the Lord's Prayer, right? But it doesn't have anything to do with this. It's just like, they're talking about torture in the Navy. Poor guy is beaten, right? And then he's just put on his bed, uh, yelled like bloody hell, and after three days, yeah, he rose again from the bed. Well, actually, it's rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the original. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, or Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, it's not the fighting navy, it's a Virgin Mary, <laughs> suffered under Pontius Pilatus, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into a hell. Yelled like bloody hell. The third day he arose from the dead. It's the dead. It's a typo. But the dead. <laughs> well, that could be Finnegan's <laughs> Ah, why did I see that? <laughs> he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Okay. So it's a travesty of his whole prayer. And um, so you can get it when you listen to the sound of it, of that whole section, right? Uh, not from the words. I mean, like, uh, this is just something that's like, well, this is strange. It sounds familiar, but it doesn't make any sense, right? So, I mean, it's like these blasphemous parodies that are all over the way of you listen to this. And uh, it was kind of like Joyce liked to play around with these, uh, let's say, canonized holy culture motifs and uh, of course, the ideology. And uh, as you know, he was uh, educated in Congo's uh, Jesuit school, um, where he received an excellent education for a while until his father was broke and couldn't pay the tuition anymore. But it kind of like also made him resentful culture like kept the culture of the Irish and uh, always, always criticized. Now it's very playful prose, of course. It's full of language gaming, as you've seen. And um, if you can put up with this, you know, like well, 628 pages, I mean, it's a great read, of course. If you think, well, you know, I get this point after I get 30 pages, uh, we'll probably, you know, take a break, pick it up six months later, Read again what you just read, and you'll find out what well, makes more sense, and it looks very different now. That's also from Ulysses, very, very famous, uh, you know, uh, 
from the last episodes, and uh, Sim Map the Sayer, and Tin Map the Tailor, and Jin Map the Jailer, and Wind Map the Waver, and Min Map the Nailer, and Fin Map the Favor, and Dim Map the Bayer, and Pin Map the Paver, and Min Map the Mayer, and Him Map the Haver, and Rim Map the Raider, and Dim Map the Kayer, and Min Map the Quaver, and Min Map the Gayer, and Dim Map the Favor. So it's like it's like a deflection. Right? So it's like um, for students who have to learn German, uh, at Taida, you know, you know, it's, you know, it's the conjugations and uh, the adjective dependence. It's about like that, right? It doesn't make much sense in itself. Uh, in this context, of course, uh, it's also making fun of this kind of like uh, Catholic uh, uh, tradition, you know, like uh, well, if you grew up in the West, you know, it, you know, so you don't have to go through this usually in Taiwan. <laughs> So it's an open text. Uh, that's like, yeah. Um, as I said, very uh, in the very beginning. I mean, everyone sees something else, and of course, it depends on what kind of books you've studied, your cultural background, which makes it so interesting to uh, see like uh, the Chinese translation that was out, uh, and kind of like see it next to like uh, other languages' translations. And of course, like it raises the question: uh, Do we have to translate it at all? Right? Because there's already so many languages in there, and uh, what stays of it? I mean, if I look at the German translations of Finnegan's Way, I think, uh, well, better not translate it, because it becomes something uh, equally unreadable, and, um, yeah, it's, it's just no fun, right? And it becomes much more technical. And, um, of course, I mean, you're kind of like a victim of the translator's uh, interpretation, which is always a big problem. Of course, uh, German is an alphabetical language, uh, which is, uh, makes it more easy to play around with words. In Chinese, of course, why well, you need like a load of footnotes to explain what you could mean, right? So, yeah, but what's good about the Chinese text is, um, as far as I've seen it, um, you get like a very good idea of the story, of the main motifs. So this is um, probably, if you want to read it, start with the Chinese version. And then, use the English one, don't look at the German one, you know? <laughs> or the French one, right? Um, so just go with that, it's a good introduction. So polyphonic prose, of course, and uh, the problem is because he mixes so many languages uh, together, um, basically in an English context still, um, it has so many layers of meaning, uh, you can't probably understand everything Joyce wanted to say. And you don't have to, basically, right? Um, sometimes, there's this one episode when Joyce, um, he was, you know, because his eyes were bad, he had a secretary and he wrote things down. And um, while he was, uh, reading his text to the end of his mind, someone knocked on the door. And he said, please come in. You know? And then he's like, okay, now read what you just wrote. And then he said, oh, please come in. He said, where is this coming from? You know? <laughs> that's what you just said. He said, no, oh, that's, yeah, that's good. You know? So it's a lot of like, spontaneous, uh, you know, playful things in there that don't make any sense. Right? To him, of course, yeah, but unfortunately, he's long been dead, so we will never know. But probably oh, would you know, say said anything anyway. Just say, Come on, read it, it's a piece of art, it's open. So, let's see. Yeah? Thank you very much. <laughs> we have any questions. If you get interested now or scared away, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> so, um, of course, I mean, talking about this book in an hour, I mean, you can only get like a very brief introduction. Um, it would take months to kind of uh, get a basic idea of it, right? Um, it's a big problem, but uh, I wish you know more people would read it. And especially since we have a very good department here in Taiwan, English department, um, dealing with you know at least sections of it, uh, I think would be very very uh, beneficial and also for students to kind of like at least expand your minds. Yeah? Uh, of course, I mean if you read it, and what do you get from it? Uh, do I, is it enlightening? No, it's not. Of course not. You know? Do I know how to live my life? No, it's art. You know? <laughs> but um, you kind of, kind of like uh, change your view at texts, and you see how everything is connected, right? Because the whole Occidental tradition is in this book, right? I mean, it's like uh, our whole history is in there. Of course, in a very, very let's say funny and uh, sometimes uh, blasphemous context. Okay, you know? But it's kind of like um, if you're interested in all this. Um, I mean, and of course, if you like James Joyce or English literature, Irish literature in general, I think it's something that has to be read. And um, if not in total, but at least parts of it, right? 
And so it's just very good to say, yeah, you know, I read Finnegan, so I go, wow. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just like, uh, okay. Yeah? So probably something to brag about, you know? but but don't brag too much because no one no details. Why you know? <laughs> so not? Yeah, so I gotta go. <laughs> so anyway, so if you have any questions, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, just a few additional reference to Tim Finnegan's way. Whiskey in Irish is Ishkbach. It means water of life. So when it was spilled by the water of life, so he came to life. <laughs> and uh, it's just interesting point. When I was studying in Ireland, we made a comparison between Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. Yeah. And uh, on the theme, somehow Ulysses, even this, the, the, the setting is in, in Dublin, but somehow it's a very European book. Yeah, of course. It's a very European. So it's choice a object, yeah, it's, it's a European text. Yeah. But when you come to look at Finnegan's Wake, it's very Irish. One. It's more Irish. It's very sense. Irish one. Uh, like Anna Livia, it's uh, Liffy. Anna in Irish is river. Yeah. Livia is Liffy. So Anna Livia is literally river Liffy flowing around which there. Which is in Dublin, of course. It's in yeah. Dublin, of course. So comparing the two, I've somehow Joyce decided he's, I'm, I'm famous now through Ulysses. I'm not going to do something I really want to do. Yeah. He has to stop uh, writing Ulysses uh, um, because he, uh, Silver Beach asked him to publish the book. Um, uh, on his birthday, so he have to rush everything. And finally he got money and found him, he said, I have, I have enough, enough time to do whatever I want. So that takes 17 years to write, getting his way and become a monster. Yeah, but how do you kind of like uh, beat the success of the first book, right? Right. Or do you so, do something original then? Yes, yeah, so, so that, I think that's a, when he finally get the chance to do whatever he likes. Yeah. And when he's drunk and... <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, that's one thing I kind of relate to his personal life as well, when his eyesight gets... Uh, Worse and worse, yeah. and uh, we, we saw in the in, in, in the in the clips earlier that he has to wear the white uh, sh that's coat uh, jacket so to reflect the light. He can only work during the daytime because he has yeah. enough light to write. So and that's the, when the time was right, right in Finnegan's Wake because the only thing he can do is to read out and uh, to listen to the words. So he doesn't really care about spelling even he's doing it intentionally but exactly. it's a book so for you to read out and to listen the graphs and meaning and uh, the only reading audio book that I can find so far is published by uh, Norton it's by, read by Jim Norton that's the only but it's a, a, a bridged one it's not written it's not written well, I think there's still like we're missing like, a total version right book, yeah like, which would be very very interesting yes if, if, we, if, if someone can really do that it will be about. <laughs> <laughs> so we give money to people who are willing yeah. to do it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah it's, it's very interesting. As you said, the Irish setting is very important. Right. Probably as, as he got older and uh, was not in Ireland anymore. Right. I was under nostalgia. You know. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Anything else? So, yeah. This is interesting. You mentioned that this is, I mean, I think this way is actually untranslatable. Uh, I know Professor Sujay, Sujay Lang has managed to try, try to translate the part of it. Well, I would like to see how you respond to that. Is that untranslatable? <laughs> 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 Into Chinese? It's so yeah. hard, I guess. <laughs> A session, I remember you, you did that. Well, I did it years ago. I almost forgot what why I chose to do that. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you very much for your very inspiring talk. Um, somehow, you know, sort of revive or resurrect some of my passion. Finnegan's way. Just like the uh, dead Finnegan that has been waking up. <laughs> um, but um, it seems to me that this took me about half a year to translate only one very short passage. Uh, um, but my experience is that um, that um, the Chinese language is really a very appropriate language to be translated into Chinese uh, because in terms of the nature of the Chinese language, that it has a lot of words with the same pronunciation, exactly the same, so that can reflect that kind of um, the rhythm of the Chinese. So if we do not understand the Wiccan language, we can and probably understand English. We can simply read it out loud. And then because um, this is a very common experience for many English-speaking people. I remember the first time that I took the uh, uh, 
course that gets weight um, in the PSU program. And the teacher, the professor, told us that when she was very, very young, and she was about six or seven years old, and her um, her mother always read for the kids' weight. Uh, it was not. It was not really my marriage. She said it was very, very wonderful and nostalgic experience because, of course, that no one really understands what, the meaning of it. But because of the rhythm, because of the uh, way we read it, that it's very funny. And she said she had a very, very you know, memorable childhood. The bedtime story. Fitting as way, that's the bedtime story. Of course, it's not tonight, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. himself made a recording written and I yeah. leave that for yeah. yeah, you can find it on YouTube. It's just all there. Yeah, yeah it's all there. He made two recordings. One is uh, from Alice, and one is uh, Anna Livia Um So, the Anna Livia Propel is much more better quality because the recording yeah. technology at the time is way better. We well, always have some yeah. Yeah. record or so. Yeah. yeah, so getting back to my well, very, very short, terribly short translation, I tried to mingle the Chinese pronunciation with the, uh, the Taiwanese pronunciation mm -hmm. and from a post-colonial perspective. Um, so I, I have to contextualize um, that translation in order to short meaning. It is basically is a kind of recreation rather yeah. than translation. So, so yeah, of course. Uh, it has to be. And what, what kind of section did you translate? I almost forgot. Yeah, it's always a shame and shame. Jute and. Much of jute. Yeah, money and jute. Thank you. It's a very, very short passage. Yeah. Interesting. So, you want to work on this in the future? Or, yeah, it would be very good for us. Uh, well, that depends on how long I can live. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very true. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's, uh, yeah, so maybe Chinese is more appropriate than mm. to find like a weak voice somehow. Mm. And uh, well, I guess Joyce would have appreciated that. <laughs> wow, I mean, like a totally foreign linguistic system somehow. Now, like, uh, and then, wow, just making it kind of like a, an East Asian wake, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that that's you know what started my dream years ago, but I find it really American. It takes a whole life to do yeah. that because uh, I try to. If you read or simply look at the words that translate, doesn't really make sense. Um, so I try to imitate the, the spirit of the waking language. Uh, it's time. Well, I wish to find the time to go on, you know? <laughs> so I think we'll really do something for my research and uh, for literature, too. You know? Yeah, probably for, for the English and the UK on the spelling. Yeah, for Chinese, probably sound. sound. She can say with the spelling. <laughs> Sounds like a very, very exciting project. <laughs> Probably too much for one person. Too yeah. exciting. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah, um, I guess we have to kind of vacate the premises right now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> or it's like 5.15, kind of have to. Tomorrow. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I wish you a very good weekend and a nice start of the week. Bye-bye. <laughs>